Well, hey, welcome to Crossroads. I'm Andy, I'm the pastor for Crossroads Anywhere. And today, our senior pastor, Brian Tome, is gonna be unpacking the Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life. But before we get there, I've got two quick things that I wanna put on your radar. A buddy of mine, Nick, he's a teammate and a 20-something, he's actually the co-host of a podcast that we have called A Better Answer, is starting a group trying to form community of other people that are in that life stage. It's such an important season of life where you're making plans and preparing and just setting the trajectory for decades to come. And we find that happens best in the context of community. If you wanna connect with other people that are kind of right where you're at in life, head to crossroads.net slash anywhere. Now, secondly, I don't know what the weather's like where you are, maybe it's beautiful, maybe it's like where I am in the Midwest and it is freezing. We're gonna take advantage of this whole Crossroads Anywhere thing. We've got people all over the country and all over the world. We're actually gonna be traveling because we want to be with you. We don't wanna connect just online or just through video like this. We want to be together. We're doing our first meetup. We're gonna be doing them all year long, every month, but our first meetup is gonna be in the Tampa and Orlando areas. We'd love to connect with you if you are in Florida. Head to crosses.net slash anywhere to raise your hand so that we can come hopefully see you before too long. All right, now we're gonna jump into It's a Wonderful Life with Brian right now. Christmas at the movies is perfect with some coffee. Don't need that ring a ling ding a dong ding a ding talking. So if we see the glow of a cellular telephone, we'll take them and we'll break them. And we won't say we were mistaken. You've been warned. Merry Christmas. Today, we look at the classic movie, It's a Wonderful Life. I'm curious, how many of us in here, I am curious of this, how many of us in here have actually seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? You've actually seen it? How many people have, have not seen it? How many people have not seen it? Okay. All the people who've seen it go, no. Oh. Okay. How many people just don't raise their hand in church? How many people, how many? How many? So let's do it real quick again. Seen it? Raise your hand. Not seen it. Okay. All right. Well, good. So this is going to be a, a stroll down memory lane for some of us who have seen it. And for others of us, I'm going to try to fill you in this movie, not because I'm a big evangelist for the movie necessarily, but because there's certain things that are in this script that I don't know that Frank Capra, who actually wrote, produced the movie, oversaw the whole project, I don't know if he really knew what he was producing, but he was producing something that was very, I believe, very close to the heart of God. Not the movie's close to the heart of God, but there are things in it that are all through the Bible that I want you to understand today because, have, raise our hand again. Who wants a wonderful life? Who wants a wonderful life? Okay. Who wants a loser life? Who wants a loser? Yeah, I want a wonderful life. I do. And this is what we're going to talk about today. So let's pray before I, I go any further. God, uh, I want the best for every life that's with us, no matter where we are this morning. I mean, geographically or spiritually, I want the best for us, and I believe you want the best for us too. And these things are what you have talked about again and again and modeled inside of your word. So help me to get those out in, a, in an understandable and winsome way. And thank you, God, for the honor of doing so. And I pray these things according to the character and identity of Jesus. Amen. So It's a Wonderful Life was a movie I never thought of or heard of until I started dating my wife, Libby. It is her favorite movie. So she watched it every year. So we've been doing this for 34 years, something like 34 years. Uh, I watch it pretty much every year. 
She watched it every year, and she loves it because it was her grandmother's favorite movie. So she thinks about her grandmother, which is like her favorite person in the world, and who's dead a long, long time, and herself, and family stuff. It's, it's just kind of a, a really good nostalgic thing. This was, a, by the way, by the way, by, this is a black and white movie, black and white. If you see the movie, understand that... Uh, this is a world of yesteryear in America. It's in black and white. Actually, it's actually in white. It's all white all the time. Everyone's white in the movie. It's all a white perspective, except there's one person of color, and she, of course, is the maid, right? That's, that's just the way it was way, way back when. But try to see past that to just see the things that are talked about. In this black and white film, by the way, black and white, but you know what we have today? We, we actually have this thing called Technicolor. Yeah. Ooh, yes. We do. This gets hot, too, by the way. This, this movie, as it was put together way back when, was meant to be a feel-good movie, but it was a very controversial movie from the beginning. You know, God is good with you feeling good. I don't know if you know that or not. He's okay with you feeling good. In fact, he's really, really, really good with you having peace because peace is... Part of what Christmas is, the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 13, if I go there, it says this. This is angels. This is angels who are proclaiming what's going to happen with the birth of Jesus, which is what we celebrate at Christmas. And they say this. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom his favor rests. Peace. Feeling good. Things going maybe wonderfully. This movie it has become a classic for two reasons. One reason is it was such a bad movie when it was first reviewed, when it first saw, that it really went out of circulation and uh, no one really went, came to show up for it. And therefore, they never really went through the process of copywriting it. So television stations said, free content we have to pay for. We're just running free content. And then it became an ultimate classic. That was one reason. The second reason was it didn't quite strike the right chord with its audiences. Frank Capra, who's the creator of the movie, he wanted a movie coming out of World War II to make people feel good. And he wanted it to be optimistic. It's actually a challenging movie in many ways. But some people didn't like this optimism. The Independent says this. As Jeannie Bassinger, author of It's a Wonderful Life book, pointed out, this was the first Christmas after the war and cinema goers were looking for undemanding optimism. I like that. Undemanding optimism. The New Republic's Manny Farber accused Capra of taking, quote, an easy, simple-minded path that doesn't give much credit to the intelligence of the audience. Yeah, right. So if you're an undemanding optimist, then you're stupid. If you're an undemanding optimist, choose to see things the positive way, then you check your brain at the door. Maybe that's why cynicism is so valued today. It really, we really think the smartest people are the most cynical people? Why is that? We think the smartest people are the most negative people? It's really weird. That's part of why our life isn't wonderful. Frank Capra, when he created this movie, I don't know if he had any relation with God or not, but what he has in this movie through and through is the values that we find in the Bible. Now, Christmas is in the Bible. Christmas is a holiday. It's a massive thing in the Bible. Christians came along later and said, hey, we should celebrate the birth of Jesus. It coincides with this other holiday. Let's do this. And off it's gone. And sometimes we get carried away. Like we get carried away when we set up our Christmas decorations before Thanksgiving. That is a, that is a heinous sin in the eyes of God. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm lighting up on that a little bit. I am. I, I, we set our tree up before Thanksgiving this year because Lib wants it. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I'm a good husband. That's all I can say. Because she's always wanting it earlier. She wants it earlier. And by the way, no lie, right now, the tree is dead. So therefore, you reap what you sow. It's all, honestly, it's a fire hazard. I can't even put the lights on. It's really, it's really, really bad. But part of the reason why I caved to her this year is because 
you know what, honey, if it helps you be more optimistic and happy, awesome. Great. In fact, I repent of any judgment of all of you people, except the ones of you that put up decorations on Halloween. You are disgusting. That is just not, <laughs> look, let's celebrate Halloween, then let's do Thanksgiving, let's do Christmas. But nonetheless, umbrella of mercy, I'm sorry for judging all of you. I think what you're trying to do is you're just trying to feel good. What's wrong with that? You're trying to be optimistic. You're trying to think of something that's out there in, in the future. And this is why all of us want Christmas, including the atheists and agnostics. We want Christmas because we want something to make us feel. We're looking for something to make us a bit more optimistic. It's a wonderful life does that. If you want a wonderful life, you follow the life of Jesus. And it just so happens the life of Jesus is actually in the life, I believe, of George Bailey. George Bailey is the main character of It's a Wonderful Life. He works in Bedford Falls, and in Bedford Falls, his dad starts a savings and loan, which is not an official bank, but it's a place to give people, loan people money who wouldn't be able to get into a house otherwise. And George has a number of things going for him. These things are the things that build a wonderful life. Number one, number one, vision. George has a vision. The Bible says that without vision, people perish. We need, a, we need a vision. What is it? A vision is something that's out there. It's not here. I don't have it right now. It's something out there. It's a place where I'm going to, where I can sink my teeth into. I'm planning against. I'm spending against. I'm praying for. And what's between where we are right now and vision are two things. Time and difficulty. That's why many of us don't have vision. We don't want to spend the time. We don't want to go through the difficulty. We want it now. I want a fun day right now. I want an easy day right now. I got a feeling that tonight's going to be a good, good night. Tonight I want it. I don't want it next week. Next, I want it now. And vision is always something substantive. The reason why we don't have it right now is it's not automatic. If it was automatic, then it would be something we all had. We wouldn't need, you don't need a vision to be able to breathe unless you're on a breathing, on a ventilator. You don't need a vision for things that are naturally going to happen to you. You need a vision for things that are out there that are difficult. And many of us just don't have any. And it's sad when we don't have anything that we don't have right now, but we're working towards and we're enduring difficulty for and we're planning towards and we're spending towards. George has a vision and it comes up again and again throughout this whole movie. His vision is to go to Europe and visit Europe, get inspiration of the greatest buildings in Europe, and then be an architect and come back to Bedford Falls, come back to America and build amazing structures. His vision isn't to run a savings alone. His vision is to be a great builder that can impact the country. And he cast this vision for himself and he cast this vision for others again and again, including the first date that he has with his future wife, Mary. What'd you wish, George? Well, not just one wish, a whole hat full. Mary, I know what I'm gonna do tomorrow and the next day and next year and a year after that. I'm shaking the dust of this crummy little town off my feet and I'm gonna see the world. Italy, Greece, the Parthenon, the Colosseum. Then I'm coming back here and go to college and see what they know. And then I'm gonna build things. I'm going to build airfields. I'm going to build skyscrapers a hundred stories high. I'm going to build bridges a mile long. Were well, you going to throw a rock? Hey, that's pretty good. What'd you wish, Mary? Buffalo gals, can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Buffalo gals, can't you come out tonight? Dance by the light of the moon. What do you wish when you threw that rock? Oh, no. Come on, no. tell me. If I don't, it might not come true. What is it you want, Barry? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Hey, that's a pretty good idea. I'll give you the moon, Mary. I'll take it. Ah, uh, it is good. He has a dream, and he's telling people about it. It's, it's the focus of his life. Now, here's the thing. 
when you have a vision, a place where you're going, the way you get there is time and difficulty. Another way to put it is sacrifice. Sacrifice. Sacrifice sounds like a really noble concept. If you think sacrifice is a really great idea and a noble ideal, then you, my friend, have never sacrificed because it sucks. And I mean that. Very few people have ever actually sacrificed. There's some of us who have had things taken away from us, some of us who have lost things. That's not the same thing as saying, I could have this, but I'm going to give that up so that I can eventually have that. It's sacrifice. Choosing to give something up because God would be happy or you want to trade up to eventually maybe have a vision. George sacrifices again and again and again and again in this movie. Over and over again. He sees his brother, his little brother, in the first scene, comes down. He falls into a, an icy pond. George jumps in to save him, and he sacrifices the hearing in one ear by trying to save a child. He sacrifices, he sacrifices when he wants, it's her turn to go to college, but he can't because his brother is going, so he doesn't go to college. George, George decides to not go on a trip he, he welcomes his brother who comes back home. I, I can't remember, was it after the war or after college? And George is ready to hand it off to him. The savings loan, good, you're going to do the savings loan. And now I'm going to go after my dreams. And he realizes his brother has just got married. And now they have dreams. And George sacrifices again and says, okay, Harry, you live your life. And I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to stay here doing the, doing the building and loan, the savings and loan. He has a wedding. Him and Mary get married. And he finally are going to be going to Europe, and he's got a wad of cash in his hand because they don't have credit cards back then. And after their wedding, they're in the car on the way to the train station to get to the airport and everything else. He sees there's a run on the, on the town bank. The depression's happening. There's crashes. People are going to draw their money out, and he thinks, oh, no, they're going to do the same things at the, sa at the savings and loan my dad started, and we don't have all the cash on hand. We're going to be run out of business. And so he runs out with all the cash and as people come to get all their money out, he talks them down and he gives them just part of their deposits back so he can keep the savings and loan alive, afloat. So the poor people who can't qualify for a conventional bank loan can actually qualify for a loan and get their own house instead of being in a slum. He sacrifices over and over again. It's inspiring when somebody sacrifices. It's inspiring because we, do, we, we really just rarely see it. I'm personally really inspired by our Dayton community. Uh, we bought a, an old Sears for our Dayton community. I've been in uh, school forever and ever and ever. And so I bought an old Sears, and they recently just got done with a campaign. That I say they because Dayton, I said they because I'm, you know, there's, there's more people who are not Dayton than there are. Dayton just had a, uh, a campaign, and they are committed to sacrificing above and beyond what they regularly give for three years to rehab this whole thing. Sacrifice. It's tough. Go without things you could have had. Lib and I realized a few weeks before that campaign in Dayton started, we realized, oh yeah, I am the senior pastor of Dayton. I guess we need to sacrifice too. And so we went through this whole process and I always go into those with my feet dragging. It's never exciting to sacrifice. If you think it's exciting to sacrifice, you're not sacrificing. <laughs> That's why it's called sacrifice. But then on the back end, whatever sacrifice you've had, and I'm not talking about financially, I'm talking also about sacrificing your preferred vacation to do a mission trip. I'm talking about sacrificing your preferred date night for something the person you're dating would rather do. I'm talking about sacrificing whatever it might be, just saying, I could have this, but I'm going to choose to not have this so I could have that or somebody else could have that. George sacrifices. When he sacrifices, he's being like Jesus. Because Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice. He went to a cross, sacrificed his life on a cross so that you and I wouldn't have to make any sacrifices when we die to get to heaven. Because Jesus paid the debt that you and I already owe so that we wouldn't have to pay that debt. He sacrificed for us. When Jesus is born which is what Christmas is about, there's an interesting sign of sacrifice that comes to him. Let's read it, the book of Matthew, chapter 2. This is the visit of the magi, of the wise men. These are 
people who were likely a sect of Zoroastrianism over in the Far East, over from Persia. And they get this dream, they get this vision that this very important individual is being born. And they, they come, they go on journey, they go on pilgrimage to find him. And when they find him, let's see what happens. Verse 11 of Matthew 2. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Let's just stop right there. Wait, go into the house. I thought that this is a stable. Okay, Jesus was placed in a manger. That's a feeding bowl for cows. The Magi don't show up until at this point they're settled in the house. So Jesus could have been two years old at this point, three years old, four years old. We don't know. But, I mean, it takes a while to, like, do a long journey and, and, and come. So Mary and Joseph are now settled. They come and they find him. And then it says this. Uh, then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Opening their treasures. You know what I think? I think what it says open their treasures, it doesn't say then they brought out their treasures. It says when they open their treasures, as if these are, these are very rich people, they've got camels and they open them, they go, hmm, now, now which things would be the most appropriate for Jesus? What, what, what would we like? To, they look at all their treasures they have with them and they choose four things, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is only what royalty would have. It was top shelf thing. Why? Because they have a king that is here. Frankincense. Frankincense was used in worship, burning of incense. Jesus is like a priest. He intercedes with us before God. And then you got myrrh. Myrrh. It's interesting. What is myrrh? myrrh? Myrrh could be just something that's valuable. It's believed that Mary and Joseph, this is actually what broke them out of poverty. It's actually what I believe. This, I believe, is what actually broke them out of poverty. These gifts that they got when their, when their son was a toddler were incredibly value and maybe gave Joseph a leg up to start investing in his business, expanding his business. This is all, don't know any of that, but all we know is Jesus was so poor, he was so poor that they didn't have a whole cloth to wrap around him. That's why I was wrapped in swaddling cloths. Not a whole blanket, swaddling cloths. Mary and Joseph sacrificed to bring their son into the world. They sacrificed their reputation to be able to have a child that people thought was born out of wedlock. And now they get rewarded. They get these, all of this, these resources. But the last one, myrrh, is pretty interesting. It was a valuable healing element. You know what else myrrh was? Myrrh was also embalming fluid. It was spices that you would take and you would put on the body and you would wrap it up. In fact, Nicodemus... Nicodemus comes in, in John 19, 39 to 40. I'm not going to read it for you right now, but it says Nicodemus comes and he brings the myrrh. He brings the myrrh. He brings the embalming fluid for the corpse of Jesus after Jesus goes to the cross. I mean, how, how, how weird and wonderful is it that Jesus' birth, he's given a gift like this. It's weird that you would give embalming fluid and it's wonderful that it was like, hey, hey buddy, this is your vision. This is your vision. Your vision is to die. The peak of your life is going to be when you sacrifice your life. Maybe the reason why more of us don't have a more wonderful life is we don't view that at all. I only sacrifice when I have no other options. I only give things over to God. I only stop doing things when I'm backed up in a corner and I have to just surrender it. George sacrifices. Jesus sacrificed. He didn't want to, he didn't want to go to a cross. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's arrested. And it says he's sweating blood. And he says, God, I don't want to do this. Take this cup from me. But not my will be done, but your will be done. Jesus is sacrificing his preferences for the will of God. Everybody who has a wonderful life, a truly wonderful, not an easy life, not an approved of life by the masses. Everybody who has a wonderful life, a life in totality, understands vision and understands sacrifice. Now, as George has this vision and he has these, I mean, again, again, and again, and again, and again. And he, and by the way, when he gives up these sacrifices, he doesn't like them. He's never like, oh, goody, I'll wait. He doesn't like them. In fact, there's times you can see his anger over his sacrifices. 
At one point, he, um, he's got a friend of his. Uh, his name is Sam. He's, uh, he's in the plastics industry. He's making all kinds of money. And Sam comes to celebrate his friend, who now he has this multinational corporation, Sam does, comes back to Bedford Falls to see this new housing development that the savings and loan is put in under George's leadership for people to have these houses. And Sam comes down to celebrate. And there's this really pivotal scene where Sam is uh, he's down in his really, really expensive Cadillac and his wife has a fur around her neck. And then there's this old jalopy, like, like it's like a Model T, I think, that the George is in. And his wife, Mary, has got this just unassuming scarf. It's like you can see the contrasting nature of both of them. And then when they part, George is frustrated and he kicks the door of his car. You can see sometimes vision frustrates. Sacrifice isn't a noble thing. It's difficult. We don't like it. And we see that with George. And that's why it's so tempting for George to turn back. The figure <clears throat> that I believe represents all that's wrong in the world is Mr. Potter. Mr. Potter is this old cranky guy who owns everything in the town. Mr. Potter, who, by the way, is the grandfather of Harry Potter. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Potter has, cares nothing about anybody. He only wants himself. He's not going to sacrifice anything. He's not going to give anything. Even when he accidentally, at a scene's climax, accidentally gets the money of the, silver, of the, of the savings and loan, it, he accidentally received it. It's an interesting scene. He doesn't even return what isn't his. He keeps it because he's all about getting ahead at the expense of other people. Potter represents what the world does to us. Represents the gnawing feeling that I'm losing, that I'm doing something wrong, that I'm not measuring up. And what do you know? George in the savings and loan is cleaning his business's clock. People are just there. It's the one thing in the town that he can't have. And so Mr. Potter finally realizes the epitome, the representation of the world. He thinks, hey, let's just get George to come work for me and then we'll eliminate all the things that I don't like. Let's, uh, let's look at that scene. The point is, I want to hire you. Hire me? Yeah, I want you to manage my affairs, run my properties. George, I'll start you out at $20,000 a year. $20,000 a year? You wouldn't mind living in the nicest house in town? Buying your wife a lot of fine clothes, a couple of business trips to New York a year, maybe once in a while Europe. You wouldn't mind that, would you, George? Would I? You're not talking to somebody else around here, are you? You know, th this is me. You remember me? George Bailey. George Bailey. <laughs> George Bailey, whose ship has just come in. Provided he has enough brains to climb aboard. Well, well, how about the building and loan? Oh, confounded man, are you afraid of success? I'm offering you a three years contract at $20,000 a year starting today. Is it a deal or isn't it? Well, Mr. Potter, I, I, I know I ought to jump at the chance, but I, I just, uh, I, I wonder if it would be possible for you to give me 24 hours to think it over. Sure, sure, sure. You go on home and talk about it to your wife. I'd like to do that. Yeah, yes. then in the meantime, I'll draw up the papers. All right, sir. Okay, George. Okay, Mr. Potter. Oh, no, 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 wait a minute here. Wait a minute. I don't need 24 hours. I, I don't have to talk to anybody. I know right now. And the answer is no, no. Doggone it. You sit around here and you spin your little webs and you think the whole world revolves around you and your money. Well, it doesn't, Mr. Potter. In the, in the whole vast configuration of things, I'd say you were nothing but a scurvy little spider. You, you... And that goes for you, too. And it goes for you, too. Ah, I love that. 
He's, you see, he's tempted like everything he could have, the trip to Europe, the salary, everything. But he realized, no, I got to sacrifice this offer because this would not be good for the town. This is why he has a wonderful life. I don't, I don't know when Jesus really understood what his life was about. All I know is eventually he said, I'm going to do that. The way that George gets through things is also similar to how Jesus chose to conduct his life. Jesus chose to conduct his life with disciples, with people around him, with friends. And George, man, he builds into people left and right. He's got this deep, deep, deep well of friends. Friends who he's helped get a house. Friends who he's given wisdom to. Friends who he's laughed with. Friends who he's been generous to. He, he just has a really, really deep bench of people who are around him. That's one of the other things we need for a wonderful life is we need community. It's not a nice to have, it's a have to have. And you don't know if you have community or not until things are going poorly. And then you either reap what you've sown, you have someone bless you and gather around you and sit in the mud puddle and prop you up and help you, or you sit alone and you get bitter and you get more lonely. We have not because we sacrifice not. And friends love to be around other people who are about other people and not just themselves. And so when George is low, he's lost all of his money because he's saved the building and loan. He's lost it all. And now he's dejected. His honeymoon is now in tathers. He can't go travel to Europe. He has no money. And that house that he and Mary on their first date threw rocks through the windows, that house ends up becoming the stopping point for their honeymoon. And it is their honeymoon. His friends gather together. His friends see how he sacrificed, what he's done. And so they try to make a makeshift honeymoon in an old beaten down house that they've been throwing rocks through. Hey, this is the company's posters and the company won't like this. How would you like to get a ticket next week? Is there any romance in you? Sure, I had it, but I got rid of it. Liver pills. Who wants to see liver pills on their honeymoon? We want us romantic places, beautiful places, places George wants to go. Hey, Bert, here he comes. Come on, we got to get this up. He's coming. Who? The groom, idiot. This is their honeymoon. Come on, get that ladder. What are they, ducks? Get that ladder. All right, all right. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. I'm hurrying. Uh, good evening, sir. Entree, monsieur. Entree. Oh, 
Remember the night we broke through windows in this old house? This is what I wished for. I'm not, if you haven't seen it, I'm not ruining anything for you. Seriously, some of us have seen it 30 times. You'll see something I'm not even talking about in this. But George, he's got this deep abiding friendships. He's got this deep abiding community. At the end of the movie, one of the, one of the uh, pinnacle lines is they say, you're a rich man, George. Not because he ever has any money in the film, but because of his friends, of his community, he is rich. We need to realize this, friends, because... We all get freaked out about the economy or get people freaked about their savings accounts and all that kind of stuff. And it's appropriate to have a certain level of concern over those things, for sure. But I don't think most of us are anywhere near as concerned about the depth of our relational life. We just think it should be automatic or it's not going to happen at all. George had the richness he had because he made sacrifices and built into people around him. And it was hard for him. Towards the end of the movie, he... He's not doing well. There's a, there's a bank examiner that comes to savings and loan, and there's money missing because his Uncle Billy has lost it, it's fallen into Potter's lap. It's a long story I'm not going to share. But basically, the building loan is going to be shut down. He's frustrated, and he can't take the pressure anymore. So he's about, he's about, he's about ready to kill himself. He feels that far down. And then an angel comes to help him understand the value of his life. And one of the things that they do is uh, the angel takes him through, through Bedford Falls, which if you hadn't existed, George, it wouldn't be Bedford Falls. It would be Pottersville. And in Pottersville, there's all kind of seedy businesses and all that sort of thing. And he's, he's trying to give him a vision of what his life would look like. I struggle with this when I first watched this. I didn't like this movie all that much when I first watched this because... When it gets into things in the spiritual realm, I've, I've, I've had a good bit of experience in the spiritual realm, and I, I know a bit about the Bible. And so this, how, how the, this angel is set up just kind of really rubbed me wrong, because it's not the way it is, but it's Hollywood, or they didn't know any better, so I'll give them grace on that. But this angel, his name's Clarence. He's a f- previous human being who is, has not yet ascended into the highest order in heaven, and that's not who angels are. Angels aren't previous human beings who then become angels. Angels are separate beings that God has created. And some of them have wings, perhaps, and some of them don't have wings. But they're separate created entities. And Clarence comes down and he does what he's doing. And I always go, oh, see, yeah, it just bothers me. And, and, and he was like this, almost like a guardian angel. My, my religiosity, my anti-religiosity made me hate the phrase guardian angel. I heard people talk about guardian angel all the time. And I just thought it was this, this construct, this thing that wasn't actually true. And then I started to realize, oh no, uh, no, it is true. In fact, there's a lot of support in the Bible for an angel. And this angel keeps George from being dead. I'm curious, how many of us in here, you, you honestly believe, and you could point to a place when you would say, I actually should have died, I should be dead. How many of us? That's me, I'm, okay. Thankful for the, for the lives that others haven't, but hopefully, maybe actually, maybe you didn't raise your hand because an angel kept it from actually happening that you even knew it was a series it could be. That's very possible. Now, when I tell you this, just understand this is something that comes up in the Bible again and again. I'll give you some examples. Hebrews chapter 11, 14. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So angels are separate entities that come and they serve those who are in the family of God. Not all people, those who will inherit the family of God. They're ministering spirits. And we don't talk too much about angels because angels don't want to be talked about. Because angels aren't about themselves. Whenever someone's really into angels, there's, there's a problem. You don't want to be really into angels, you want to be really into Jesus, not into angels. Because angels are about Jesus, they're not about themselves. But, having said that, but having said that, 
angels will come and take the form of a human being from time to time. The Bible says many have entertained angels and don't even know it. So they took on the form of, a, of an angel. I've heard some stories of uh, my mother-in-law believes that her dead sister who died while she was babysitting her came and visited her the night that she was uh, uh, one night. And I was like, no, uh, Carol didn't come visit you. She didn't. Maybe, maybe an angel took her form to come and give you comfort. But Jesus makes it very, very clear that no one passes from here to there. So angels are real. We just have a lot of misperceptions about them. One of the things to understand is you're really important. And if you're a follower of Christ, you have an angel assigned to you. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. You say, well, you just can't get that from one verse. Okay, let me give you a couple others. In the book of Acts chapter 12, 15, Peter is in jail, and there's a miraculous way for him to escape, and all the other believers, his friends, his community, are hunkered down, thinking they have no out at all. They're freaked out. Peter shows up, can't get in the door, knocks, someone goes and sees who it is. It's like, ah, Peter, slams the door in his face. Oh my gosh. Goes back, tells the hey, hey, P- P- Peter's here. P- I just saw Peter. Is it? They're like, oh, it's not Peter. He's in, in a Roman jail. He's not getting out of that. And they say this. They say, they say this. And they said to her, you're out of your freaking mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. It's his angel. So they go, no, it's probably just his guardian angel look, looking like him. That's what the early followers believed. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 18, 10, here's what he says. He says, see that none of you do not despise one of these little ones, one of these little children of God. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Their angels, possessive, T-H-E-I-R, not there are angels. Their personal angel always sees the face of God in heaven. I mean, I I think that's why I'm alive. I understand me being alive as there was an angel that's helped me from time to time. And sometimes whatever, angels choose not to do that and we die and life goes on, you know? And life is difficult. We sacrifice. This isn't ensuring life is going to be easy, but I'm saying there is an X factor to have a wonderful life when you're following Jesus and you have an angel that's assigned to you. Back in my day, little kids didn't play video games. They weren't invented. We built tree houses. Tree houses on somebody else's land or public land. We'd take our dad's tools and find rusty nails. We would straighten and we would, we would raid a local a subdivision where a new house were being built. We'd steal their wood. God bless America. And then we would go out. We would build these tree houses. And I mean, I mean like 20, 30 feet up in the air on limbs as big as my thumb with nails that weren't, weren't very long enough to hold the wood. In it. And I think, well, how in the world do we never fall? No one ever... One of us had an angel. That's why. No question. How in the world am I going 70, 80 miles an hour on a rented Harley Davidson in Montana about a decade ago, and I hit a deer going 80 miles an hour, and I go through the deer, and I go down the road about 60 yards, flying and rolling, and I don't have a helmet on. And what I get is I get five stitches in my left two knuckles. People go, you should have worn a helmet. No, I should have worn gloves. That's what I should have worn. <laughs> You'll never be able to tell me that wasn't my guardian angel on job that day. The perfect geometry for me to hit my back break poorly so it skids. So when I hit that thing, I go over, not head first, I go over sideways and land on my side, impacting the body and take that and go all the Ridiculous. Ridiculous. That's what God does. Now I say this to us to go, this, this should be encouraging. It's encouraging. You're really important to God. He's got a safety net around you. Don't abuse it. Doesn't always work for whatever reason, but you're really important and He wants you and you need to have a wonderful life. Clarence, this angel, does his job. George sees how good his life actually is. And he goes all the way back to the house. And the bank examiner's there with the beady eyes. He's going to throw him in jail with the, with the sheriff who's got the warrant for his arrest. And, all, and the money has to be made whole that's been lost. And look what happens to George through his friends. Oh, <laughs> 
Now, get this. It's from London. Oh. Mr. Gower cabled you need cash. Stop. My office instructed to advance you up to $25,000. Stop. Oh. Hee-haw and Merry Christmas, Sam Wainwright. Oh. As soon as I got Mary's telegram. Good idea, Ernie. A toast. <laughs> to my big brother, George, the richest man in town. <laughs> really good. His brother comes in at the end. You know, Harry, Harry is an awful person. He sucks. Seriously. You're, the whole movie, all he does, he takes, takes, takes. He's a nice guy, really happy, but he takes. He never says. Even at the end, even at the end, everyone's giving money to help. He doesn't. He just takes a drink. Oh, great drink. I'm making a toast. Good public appearance. But he never gives anything the entire time. I mean, in terms of himself, never sacrifices. He does not have a wonderful life. He smiles a lot, but he doesn't have a wonderful life. Look, you can have, you can have a life like George. You can have a life like Harry. Actually, more consistent. You can have a life like Jesus. Or you can have a life like everybody else. The path to a wonderful life is this. Have a vision in your life. Get ready to sacrifice. Have friends around you that you enjoy life with and you're a backstop for one another. And see that there are angels. Recognize that there's an X factor, the presence of God that you get if you have Jesus that should give you a little motivation and encouragement to take a risk. God wants you to have this year a wonderful life. Let me pray for you. And I pray here. There's some folks who are like, hey, I've never heard the angel perk thing before. Maybe that does it for you to get you over the edge and actually become a follower to receive Jesus. Let me pray for you right now. God, I, I thank you for your, um, your generosity in giving us Jesus. And we pray that you would, you would fill us with your vision and wisdom. And God, some of us want to receive you for the first time. We're thankful for your sacrifice. We say, Jesus, I want you in my life. I ask you to forgive my, me of my sin. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I commit the rest of my life to you. Lord, thank you for being patient with our lives and for having a vision for us to have a wonderful life. You're good because of your son Jesus was so good to us. And I pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hey, thank you guys so much for joining us today. I've got two quick things before you go. The first is this is a big time for year-end giving. Crossroads is no different. We're a nonprofit and 
we want to help you make the most of your year-end gifts. We believe in the work that we do and have seen it change lives all across the nation and the world. If you're considering where to uh, allocate your year-end giving, hey, head to crosswood.net slash give for more info and to join the team there. Secondly, hey, we wanna keep you in the loop on what's going on with us as a community. If you go to crosswoods.net slash anywhere, scroll all the way down to the bottom in orange, there's a spot where you can create an account that'll make sure you don't miss a single great thing or bit of content or chance to connect here at Crossroads. Hey, thank you guys so much. Real quick, I have a Christmas gift for you next week. We're gonna be hearing from our very own Chuck Mingo. You don't wanna miss it. See you next week.